Okay, good evening and welcome back to our Nordic Market Outlook session on Thursday evening. My name is Tony Zhang. I'm the Chief Strategist here at Options Play. We have a lot to cover here today because markets are looking a little weaker here today. So let's go ahead and take a look. Now, before we do, just a quick disclaimer. What we're going to discuss here today is purely for demonstration purposes. It is not a solicitation or recommendation to buy or sell any specific security. So let's first off and start and see a look at the OMX S30. Now, today what I want to do is I want to zoom out a little. I want to take a step back because we've been looking at some fairly high frequency data for the most part for the last few weeks. We've predominantly been looking at the daily charts. We've noticed this very large rally about 50% back to that 15 Hundred level, we broke out above the 1500 level, but as we continue to move higher, notice how momentum barely budged higher. This is showing us signs of exhaustion here for the overall market. Now, one of the things I want to point out is that if we look at a weekly chart, uh, you'll notice that we've we've bounced about 50% off of that weekly chart. Now we've just come across the 200 week moving average, and as of as of today, it's actually managed to, or yesterday we managed to break above it. But today we're just sitting right below that 200 day, 200 week moving average. Now that's likely going to be in the short run provide some kind of support or uh, resistance rather. As you can see previously, this level provided quite a bit of support on the downside. And now what we're expectation is that it's going to provide some resistance to the upside. Now I will say that given how strong the markets have been, uh, given the fact that we also have to consider the the sheer amount of quantitative easing that we have seen here in the markets, I do think we have to account for there is the possibility of the markets continuing to grind a little higher here and overshoot a bit to the upside, all the way up as high as that 1650 area. As you can see, 1650 is a 20-week moving average as well as the 200-day moving average. So you have quite a bit of resistance up here. So I do think that it's possible for the markets to push back a little bit higher before it can you know, start to resume its move lower. So there are a lot of things to watch here, but a lot of developments. We're starting to see a little bit of weakness this week. And also one thing that I want to note is that momentum indicators are what I would consider short term fairly overbought, um, especially in the weekly chart. Um, what we see here is that the RSI, the relative strength index, is substantially higher than the, uh, the, its moving average. So we always look at the RSI in comparison to its nine period moving average, and it's substantially higher. Whenever it deviates very far away from its moving average, that's usually a good signal to, uh, to uh, seek a reversal here, and that's exactly what we're seeing. Again, there's still the possibility that you get one more candle higher before this reverses lower, but there certainly are many indications right now that we're starting to see some exhaustion from this uh, fairly strong rally in the markets in the face of very weak economic fundamental data that we're currently looking at. You know, I think there's a lot of disconnect for those of you that are reading the headlines as far as what economic data looks like versus where the equity markets are currently trading. So that's what we currently see with the Stockholm market. The Copenhagen market is a little different here. The Copenhagen market from an indicator's perspective, very similar. Uh, so we've had this very strong, basically straight up rally here, while momentum over the last few days, as you can see, has really kind of stopped moving any, stopped moving higher. And that's telling me again, that this rally is starting to run out of steam. It's starting to get exhausted. And there's a high probability of a short-term pullback that doesn't mean that it can't continue moving higher and maybe retest this $1,300 level before starting to move lower. But at this time, we're starting to see some signs of these exhaustion. On the weekly chart, it managed to break above that 20-week moving average. So that is something to consider here is the fact that it did manage to break above that 20-week moving average. Now, again, this in itself, I think, is fairly bearish from the perspective of you have this RSI that's well above its moving average. I think what you're going to start seeing is some selling pressure as markets start to resume any higher here. So, you know, one of the things that I do want to note here is that something that we've, we've been talking about for quite some time is really the difference between the Copenhagen and Swedish, uh, the Copenhagen and Stockholm index. Uh, we've seen significant declines in terms of uh, 
outperformance or significant underperformance of the Swedish markets versus the Danish markets. And we're actually continuing to see that. We started to see this reverse a little bit earlier this week or between last week and this week, but that trend has started to continue um, again, where the Swedish markets are continuing to underperform the Danish markets. And I think a lot of it still comes down to some of the COVID-19 trends that we're looking at. Now, this is a stock, this is a chart that we've been following for quite a few weeks now. Oh, sorry. This is a chart that we've been following for quite a few weeks now. The one thing I will, that I want to point out here is that clearly, as you can see, Sweden has had roughly 10, five to 10 times the number of deaths as the other Nordic countries, Norway, Denmark, and Finland. And this chart, you know, sometimes I think actually is a little misleading because this is an exponential chart. So to go from here to here is from 10 to 100, but from here to here is 100 to 1,000. We're talking about a 10 time, 10 time multiplier because that's really the only way to graph some of these exponential functions before this because if we didn't do it that way, Sweden would be off the charts over here while Denmark and Norway are down here. So we use an exponential chart. So sometimes this is a little misleading, but the thing that we need to pay attention to is that Sweden is still not completely flat yet. It still kind of has an, a bit of an upward project, uh, projection on it versus Denmark, Finland, and, and Norway are basically flat at this point. Uh, Denmark still have, has a little bit higher, um, but for the most part, as you can see, the number of deaths is significantly lower. So Sweden is clearly past the hump. They've clearly been able to, to flatten the curve, but they're, they're seeing uh, this continue to extend. You could say that Sweden is better off from the perspective of as a result of this, they have relatively lower risk of a second wave compared to Norway, Denmark, and Finland where they, when they reopen up their economy, they may experience a second wave and they may have to shut down their economy again. Um, so it, Sweden obviously taking a very divergent path from everyone else. And they are certainly paying for that in terms of the number of deaths, but perhaps longer term, this may be the better solution for the country from an economics perspective. Um, so, However, the one thing I will say that we believe that this was part of the reason why we saw some outperformance of the Danish markets compared to the Swedish markets because they lock down, they're, they're reopening up their economy, they have a pretty good sense of when things are going to get back to normal. Sweden is still unclear as far as when they're going to really get back to normal where people are going to feel really comfortable getting back to work or when companies are going to open up. Um, you know, I still hear many reports of sweet of of foreign countries that have Swedish offices that have told their employees to work from home, uh, telling them not to go back to work just yet. So that's obviously going to have some effect as far as how long that's going to last. It's still unclear at this point. And I think that's part of why we're seeing this underperformance of the Swedish markets compared to the Danish markets. So this is the chart that we've been looking at, which is the OMS S30 compared to the OMX C25. And this is something we've been talking about for quite a few weeks now, but for pretty much the most of last year or the past two years, you know, this, this, these two indices basically perform on par with each other. They have very short periods of outperformance or underperformance, but for the most part, they trade within a tight range, meaning one doesn't truly outperform the other. They kind of trade pretty much lockstep with each other. And a lot of these whipsaws comes down to some of the individual names in a particular market. But in March, this really started to break down. Now, this trend currently is still continuing lower. This, there's, we have started to see perhaps a bottom in formation here, but you know, at this point, we're still expecting this to continue move, to move lower. We don't quite have that sign yet of this, of this um, starting to come back into that 1.35 area, which is what we would be looking for. You know, it continues to make lower lows and lower highs telling us that this trend is still continuing. So underperformance of the Swedish markets compared to the, 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 the Danish markets. So based on all of this, we wanted to take a look at what opportunities do we see in the market? So, you know, if we just go back here to, the, to this uh, real quick, you know, there certainly seems to be a ton of resistance in the Swedish markets in this 1570 to 1650 area. So I would expect that as markets kind of continue to move here, you're going to get sellers stepping in to try to uh, push this market down. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to reverse lower. It just means that it's going to have a tough time breaking above 
1670 level in my opinion. So if you're looking at the Swedish markets, I think this is the time where you might want to, if you own some equities, think about start taking a look at um, taking some profits on those equity positions, especially on stocks that perhaps you have purchased over the past year between January and February. And I'll just take a look at a chart here. You know, the OMX S30 has pretty much spent a long amount of time. Uh, so let's see, how far back does this go? Um, really going back to as far back as December of 16, when we were back in this 1500 level. So from December of 2016 to uh, the breakout here, which was roughly in November of 2019, the stock markets in Sweden have made almost no progress. So you basically have a lot of whipsawing here. You broke out to the upside, made a pretty nice run to the upside and immediately broke out to the downside. Now we're right back inside of this range. So my expectation, at least for now, is that you may retest the top of that range, but for the most part, you're likely going to re-enter this range unless it breaks to the downside. Now, I think that the possibility or the probability of this breaking back up to the upside is relatively low um, based on the economic and fundamental data that we're looking at. I'm curious to see if anyone else has a different opinion. If you have an opinion on that, please type in into the chat window whether you think the markets are going to break out or break down from that zone, which is again, roughly about that 1500 to 1670 level. Because again, the Swedish markets have been in this range since December of 2016, I think is what I said. Yeah, December of 2016. So that's almost four years of no progress in the markets, managed to break to the upside, broke down to the downside, and now we're back in the middle of that range. So my expectation again for now is that we'll maintain or stay in this range for now until it manages to break one way or another. So my indication here is that if you're looking at the equity markets here, anywhere in the 1600 to the 1660 level, you're going to have sellers that are going to be stepping in, uh, pushing this market uh, or making it difficult for the markets to pass past the 1660, 1670 level. So some of the ideas that we want to put together here uh, was to look at the Swedish markets and look at some of the stocks that are relatively weak that may see some selling going into this particular um, market. So one of one of the uh, the industry one of the sectors that we're looking at is really banking. Now banking recently had a bit of a, a run to the upside. So if we look at Swede um, Swede Bank, uh, whoops, this is not the right one. Uh, Swede A. Oh, this is, sorry, this is, this is the weekly chart. Okay. So one of the things you might notice is that the Swede Bank had a decent run to the upside in the last few weeks. But if we zoom out to the weekly chart, this is really a particularly weak chart in my opinion. So you have a, you have a, you have a stock that has really continued to underperform the market for the past year going from about 200 down to 100 during the sell-off here. Um, but it, it sold off well before the sell-off here. So, you know, it was trading at around 120, even back here in December of 2019, when equity markets were reaching their all-time highs. This stock was reaching its all-time lows. That, just from a pure relative strength perspective, does not look particularly good. So if you have that 120 level as resistance for multiple, or as support for multiple months, and now it's coming back to retest that as resistance, that's telling me that there's a higher chance of this stock now moving lower from this particular level. So we've had this rally up to this 120 level, and I think that you're going to likely get a rejection here, or at least it's probably gonna have a tough time breaking above 120, especially if you consider global interest rate. Global interest rates being zero, especially in Sweden, where you have zero interest rates you know, these banks, they make their money from interest rates. So when interest rates are zero, it's, very, it's a very tough environment for these firms to make any money or make any revenue. So that's why when I'm looking at this type of, uh, when, when a stock like Sweet Bank manages to rally back to its resistance level, I'm looking to fade that type of strength and look for selling call credit spreads here is the strategy that I would be looking at. Now you can buy puts as well, but you know, buying puts, in my opinion, is a little, um, is expecting a little, in, in my opinion, a little too much here. 
Um, so I would be looking at something like the 117, 125 call spread. Here, as you can see, on a seven, seven and a half dollar wide credit spread, I'm collecting $2 and two, 295 crowns. Uh, so I'm risking a little under, a little, uh, I'm collecting more than roughly about 40% of the width. So 290 divided by 750. I'm, I'm collecting 38% of the width, um, which is a little bit more than a third, which is typically what I'm looking to collect here on a, on a strategy like this. And my break even is 120.45. So as long as Sweet Bank stays below 120, this strategy is profitable by the June 18th expiration. So this is a strategy that you could utilize that's, that's not bearish, but what it is, it's, it's not bullish. So because if you were bearish on this trade, you can actually buy a put spread. So this is really where I think we can really compare selling a call spread versus buying a put spread. And in order to make sure that we're comparing the right strategy here, let's say I'm willing to risk 2,000 crowns on this particular trade. What that means is that I can sell four contracts of the credit spread, or I can buy three contracts of the debit spread. And if I compare these two side by side, I can say, well, what happens if, if this stock stays just around 117 and doesn't move any lower? If that's the case, clearly selling the credit spread will be better. I'm collecting 11, almost 1,200 crowns here on the credit spread. If I bought the debit spread, I'm losing 1,500 crowns. And obviously, you wouldn't want to buy a put if you think the stock's gonna move a little bit higher, right? So, however, if you do think the stock's gonna make, make a move lower, let's just say you think it's gonna move back into the middle of that range. So it's been trading in this range since uh, the, the beginning of March. So let's say you think it'll go back down to let's say 108. I would say that's a fairly conservative one. Notice how the credit spread and the debit spread are almost identical. You're looking at about roughly 1,200, 1,100, 1,200 crown profit. So if you think the stock's going to make it back into the middle of the range, these two strategies are very comparable. If you think it's going to make it down to the bottom of that range, 102 or so, then that's where I think the put spread makes more sense. Buying this put, as you can see, will generate a almost a 3,000 crown profit for the same amount of risk. So these two strategies are roughly risking the same amount. Here I'm risking 1,800 crowns. Here I'm risking 1,695. So Selling the credit spread is useful if you think the stock is going to be fairly neutral or stay a little bit lower. But if you think the stock can make it all the way down to 102, which is the bottom of the range, it was trading there in the beginning of April, I'm sorry, mid-April, then your put spread will give you a significantly higher return here in the, the 3,000 crown range uh, or potentially even more. So your max profit here is 3,500 crowns if the stock is below 100 crowns by the June expiration. So you still have about 50 days to go from there, um, but this is a strategy that I would start looking at if you believe that this rally is going to start to turn over, you think that the markets are gonna start turning lower, you can start using these types of strategies. You know, in my opinion, I think you're better off collecting some premium here. If let's say you're able to collect 1,100 crowns, and then what you do is you take that premium and as the market starts to roll over, then you start to buy some puts because the market hasn't rolled over yet. I just want to be very clear. What we're saying is that there's a, there's a higher chance now of the markets um, moving lower, but it hasn't started to move lower yet. So it's important to make the distinction between the two that we're not saying that the market has rolled over, but the market has the ability to roll over here. So to prepare for that, you're better off selling premium, collecting that premium, and then when the market does roll over, then you start buying puts. So I hope that I was able to make that distinction clear. The next strategy I was looking at is a, is a similar type um, play here, where uh, INDU, INDU, uh, the reason that I wanted to take a look at it is because it has, you know, it, it's really been fairly range bound. It's, it's gotten, it's been in this area in this 200 to 10 area for weeks. It hasn't been able to break out above it. Uh, the momentum continues to weaken. You have kind of this, uh, I would say major resistance of around 210. You tested it as support during the sell off. It tested it again a couple of weeks ago. It looks like it was just being rejected here this week. So is this necessarily going to move lower? Not necessarily, in my opinion, but I do think that 210 is a major resistance level that this stock is going to have a tough time breaking above. So the strategy here is very similar to 
the Swede Bank one. And the reason that I'm looking at these types of strategies is because normally to collect a credit spread, here I found a 10 crown wide credit spread. Normally for a 10 crown wide credit spread, I'm looking to collect 333 crowns per contract. Here I'm able to collect 400 crowns, so 40% of the width. So that is really why you know these are fairly attractive plays from an options probability perspective, because again, normally I'm risking two to one. Here I'm only risking one and a half to one. That's a significantly better risk to reward ratio. So because of that, that's really why I think you have a bit of an edge here selling something like the 210, 220. Is that, sorry, I forget which strikes I was looking at before. Uh, 205, 215. So 205, 215, um, as you can see, collects roughly 400 crowns. And the break even here is 209, which is right in line with the 210 resistance level that I was showing you here before, right? 210. So as long as the stock stays below 210, in this particular case, you know, right below that 209, then you're able to take profit. You're able to be profitable on this particular trade. And only if the stock makes a big move to the upside and gets back up to 215, you're risking 600 crowns to make 400 crowns. That risk to reward ratio is much better than the typical two to one that you would be expecting on a credit spread like this. Um, again, if you if you do collect these 400 crowns, then once you use once you collect that 400 crowns, you can then use those profits to potentially buy a put or a put spread if and when these stocks start to roll over. Uh, you know, I would really like to see, in my opinion, um, a breakdown of this. So you kind of have this. Uh, let's just call it a, a, tr a triangle here, right? So you have this triangle formation and it's becoming tighter and tighter into this apex of this triangle, right? And it could continue doing this for quite some time and eventually it will break away one way or the other. So if it breaks to the upside, I would certainly consider at that point getting out of the credit spread. But if it does break to the downside, then you can take some of the credit that you receive to potentially start buying some puts uh, on this particular trade if you do think that the stock can make it down to 190 or even as low as 170 to the downside. So um, there, those are a few different ways that I would play this particular indicator. And lastly, what I want to do is leave you guys with, with some other you know, more bullish stocks. And I think if you focus on some of the more utility-like stocks or stocks that um, have potential as a result of coming out of this coronavirus, like Ericsson B, and we've talked about Ericsson for quite a few weeks now, this stock remains relatively strong. So let's take a look at Ericsson B. As you can see here, this stock has remained robustly strong. Um, you know, for the last few years or so, it's really been outperforming the equity markets. When the markets were pretty much flat, this market has been outperforming. And during the sell-off, it has not sold off nearly as much. It's only sold off, it's about 10% away from its all-time, from its uh, recent highs. So this stock has continued to show incredible amount of strength here. So I think this is a stock that if you're looking to buy some stocks, these would be the types of names that I would be looking for, is these very strong from a relative strength perspective. Now, you know, we, you have to keep in mind that you do have this kind of, this bearish trend line here. Um, I don't think you can really ignore that bearish trend line here. So I do want to see more of a breakout here before I would go long this particular stock. But at least in this particular zone, I think you can collect some premium by selling some put spreads here. So what I was looking at here for Ericsson B was here, I was looking at selling the 85-80 put spread here. I'm not collecting as much of the width here. Uh, let's just take a look. I was looking at selling the 85-80 put spreads, which collects a 180. So on a five crown wide credit spread, I'm usually looking to collect 167 crowns, which is one third of the width. This is 180 crowns. It's a little better, not as be not as good as the 40% that we had before, but certainly, you know, 37, 36% of the width. Certainly better than the 33 that we normally would would seem to collect. And the break even here is 83.20. So you're actually above your break even price already. So as long as the stock stays, I'm sorry, yeah, you're well above your break even price at 85. So as long as the stock stays above 83.20, this strategy will be profitable. Now. This bullish spread, not as 
attractive, in my opinion, from a probability-based perspective as the other two, but certainly uh, one way to look at taking a look at some bullish potential plays here in the markets as well. Because despite the fact that I think that there's a higher risk of the markets moving lower, it's important to remember that there's, I think when we come out of the coronavirus, there's going to be a bifurcation, in my opinion, between companies that have versus companies that are, do that have not. Um, companies that are well diversified, companies that are um, that have strong balance sheets that will be able to survive this will have a much better time and likely perhaps uh, acquire some weaker players in this in, in their particular industry. Ericsson certainly is in that particular space of, of the strong company that is likely going to outperform after the result of this. And then you're going to have plenty of weak companies that perhaps have a high amount of debt that have supported their stock by share buybacks over the past few years that have really not outperformed the markets at, at all or really, really performed on par with the markets at all that are really going to struggle over the next few years. And I think there's, you're going to have this bifurcation between stocks that have versus stocks that have not. So I think there are opportunities on both sides, but the risks at this point right now, I think in my opinion, are skewed to the downside uh, based on the research that we're currently doing here on the OMX S30. So that's the research that I have to share with you here for today. I hope that this was useful in helping you understand where we currently sit within the markets how we're looking at positioning in this particular market, specifically around option strategies that allow you to fade this type of strength. You know, we've had a very strong rally from this 12, 1280 level up to 1600. Rallies never, you know, uh, you never have rallies this strong without having some bit of a give back. And I think that we're, we're at that point where you're gonna get a bit of a give back you might, that might gather enough strength to get it back up to that 1670 level, but I think you're really going to have some tough time around that 1670 level for the markets to continue pushing higher beyond that. So with that, thank you so much. I hope you guys have a great evening. And again, hope that you guys find this useful. We'll send this recording out to you guys in a few minutes as soon as we're done here. Now, before I sign off here, does anyone have any questions that I can help answer in the next few minutes here? If you have any questions, feel free to type them into the chat window, and I'll try to answer a few questions before I sign off here today. Uh, Tariq is asking, can we have a look at AstraZeneca? Let's take a look at AstraZeneca. And so pharmaceuticals have remained very strong. This chart looks very similar to pretty much all of the other pharmaceuticals. Oh, this is, sorry, this is the AstraZeneca ADR. Let me find the Stockholm one. Um, so this chart looks very similar to pretty much all of the other pharmaceutical uh, names that we're looking at. It recently... Uh, basically broke out above resistance here around a thousand. It, it kind of consolidated a bit and starting to push higher. You know, I, I think that there's still some strength left in some of this. You know, one of the things I will say is that what concerns me about this is as this market continues to push higher, this is a weekly chart, momentum continues to get weaker. So what that tells me is that every single push higher, I think has a higher probability of a push lower. Money flow also, as you can see, continues to weaken as you continue to move higher. This is a concern for me. I would be very careful about continuing to go along this particular stock. Can it keep moving higher? Absolutely. You know, we've seen plenty of stocks that can go, um, you know, much higher actually while resistance continues to move lower. You know, that is still a possibility. I'm not saying that's not possible, but each subsequent move, you know, we've already had one, two, one, two, this is the third move. You could have one last push to the upside before this stock kind of starts to fall back. But I would be very careful about continuing to push higher. If you own the stock, I think selling cover calls is a, is a, is a very good strategy at this point to consider getting yourself out of these stocks, especially if it makes one more run to the upside. Um, you know, pharmaceutical stocks right now are trading on a bit of hype. You know, a lot of it, a lot of um, interest in pharmaceutical stocks. The thing is that you have ETFs, so you have investors that are chasing uh, potential, let's just say, uh, cures for the coronavirus, cures, uh, vaccines, and, and you have capital flowing into a lot of these index funds that track 
all pharmaceutical stocks. And you have stocks like AstraZeneca that are benefiting from that, even if they don't necessarily have a drug that's in the running for curing the coronavirus or a vaccine for the coronavirus. But you're just seeing a lot of inflows into pharmaceutical and biotech stocks. That's really causing a lot of this rally. But again, there are plenty of signs here that this momentum is coming to an end. Um, so that, that's my take here for AstraZeneca. Any other questions for stocks? Uh, what trading platform is good here in Sweden? So I basically hear of pretty much two names when I ask around, and that's Nordnet and Avanza. Um, I, I know Interactive Brokers also uh, accepts clients from Sweden. So I would say those are the probably the top three that I would look into. Any other questions? If there are no other questions, thank you so much for taking the time out here this evening. Again, I hope that this was useful in helping you understand how to position for the market, how to utilize options for positioning in that particular market. And I, we will send you the recording as soon as we're done here today. So thank you so much. I hope you guys have a great evening.